This week's episode is brought to you by Walt's Wed in Westcott, formerly known as A Night at the Walt Disney Family Museum. Sure, we had to change locations and venues, but it's still the same great show, and we're going to do a lot more for you, and it's going to be a lot more fun. For more information, visit www.thedisneyproject.com, and you can buy tickets today. Welcome to Season 3! Hello, and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And thank you for coming back to another fun-filled episode of our show. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Oh, I wasn't specifically directing that towards you, but I'm glad you actually came back, because when you're not here, it's, it's, you know, one half of a show. It's like and, you're talking to yourself. Uh, yeah, which I do most of the day anyway. <laughs> so it's better when I have someone <laughs> responding to what I'm saying. And, and someone else to blame when things go horribly wrong. That's true, because I do usually blame you. That is true. Exactly. They it's, don't it's usually different. hear that part, though. That's, that's well, I, behind I, the scenes. Yeah, I see it in the production notes all the time. Well, like, well I, I edit it out. This. I edit George, it out. Oh, that's true, but you have to spend so much more time doing that. I know, but I just want to make it seem like you're the jerk, not me. So I have to all take right. all that stuff out. That's fine. I can deal with it. It works, right? I can live with it. Oh, yeah, it's fine. I mean, that's our thing. It is our I'm thing. The, I'm the grumpy one. You are the grumpy one. You're the grumpy George. <laughs> Mer- merchandise available now, everywhere. If it fits right, we're grumpy George shirts. It's time for Disney History! So, this week, we're going a little outside of our norm again and looking at one of those uh, long-lost Southern California attractions that some people may remember and others will probably think that we are making up. Uh, (laughs) But I assure you, this one is definitely real, as weird as it sounds. Um, And in fact, it was one of the the oldest, I'm sorry, it was the oldest zoological attraction in California up until its closing. And that, of course, is the California Alligator Farm. Now, what what do they do there? Well, of course, they grow alligators. That's the only logical thing that they do. (laughs) The original alligator farm, it actually dates way back to 1906, when it was originally located in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And the farm was started by Joseph Alligator Joe Campbell and Francis Victor Sr. Uh, Also, that's an awesome nickname. I kind of want my name to be (laughs) Alligator Joe. Alligator Jeff. Alligator Jeff. I guess that makes more sense than Alligator (laughs) Joe. (laughs) Thanks, George. (laughs) What would I do without you? (laughs) So these two guys, Alligator Joe and uh, Francis Victor Sr., they actually amassed this small fortune by capturing all sorts of reptiles and putting them on display. Wow. So, okay, in in 1907, Alligator Joe met Francis Ernest, a one-time mining camp cook, and they decided to move the exhibit to Southern California by rail car, where it would uh, hopefully be more successful. Now, Ernest already owned an ostrich farm in L.A., and for some reason, they thought the best place to put the alligator farm was right next to the ostrich farm. Uh, That just really sounds like a terrible idea, even on paper. But regardless, Alligator Joe hung a banner over the side of the train advertising the Los Angeles alligator farm and unloaded the animals at the corner of Mission Road and Lincoln Park Avenue in Los Angeles. I bet he'd get arrested if he did that today. (laughs) <laughs> well, just letting animals out like that. So the the Lincoln Heights neighborhood where the alligators were unloaded was actually a pretty popular weekend getaway at the time, so it would certainly bring a lot of foot traffic to both the farms. So visitors entered the farm through a white stucco building where they would pay the 25 cent admission fee, and of course they would have the opportunity opportunity to buy all sorts of uh, reptilian trinkets as well, you know, because nothing says a good time like taking a <laughs> rubber alligator home to little Johnny. Uh, exactly. Okay, now the the alligators were kept out back behind the building and segregated according to size in 20 different ponds. Um, uh, The alligators would range in size from just a few inches up to 13 feet. Thank goodness they couldn't jump more than a foot. Thank God. Uh, Uh, The the idea was that the larger ones (laughs) would eat the smaller ones if placed together, so the segregation was a good idea. Uh, And they ranged in age from the newly born to much, much older ones. 
Now, by, by 1909, the farm began to supply the motion picture industry with the uh, reptilian stars for some of their movies. And uh, some of the alligators can be found in movies such as King Solomon's Mines, uh, The Adventures of Kathleen, and many of the Tarzan films. Um, and some even found their way into the Walt Disney films, including The Happiest Millionaire. So, bam, there is a Disney connection this week in Disney history. Don't write us hate mail. <laughs> Because we've never received any hate mail. Actually, I don't think we ever. have received any hate mail. Actually, you're right, we haven't. So Good don't us. send us any hate mail. Now That's we a, jinxed it. Subliminal message brought to you by Heimbuck Productions. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Uh, in 1911, Ernest bought out Alligator Joe and took over the alligator farm for himself. He began to add iguanas from South America and two-foot-long chuckwalla lizards. Uh, chuckwalla lizards uh, would expand their lungs until they were twice their normal size. Uh, they were particularly prone to such blow-ups when the alligators threatened to swallow them. Uh, something tells me that Ernest didn't think this thing through all the way. I don't think he did. No. So, by, uh, in 1915, movie producer William Selig, he transformed the 32 acres adjacent to the farm into the Los Angeles Selig Zoo. Now, Selig discovered a lot of the movie stars at that time, and he also made money by manufacturing and distributing a lot of movie equipment that he invented himself. And uh, because of the connection, Lincoln Park would become the backdrop for several of the Tarzan movies starring uh, Johnny Westmuller. Um, however, the big star would be Billy the Alligator, who was supposedly the oldest alligator in captivity at the farm, and he actually garnered the most attention, more so than the Tarzan films. Well, I mean, Johnny Weissmuller, there's another Disney connection. That is another Disney great connection. Great movie ride. Two. Two for one. There we go. Not bad. Okay, so going back to Billy the Alligator, which is an awesome alligator name, he was captured in 1906 in a swamp near New Orleans. Visitors would hold their breath when veteran alligator wrestler George Link would wrestle Billy and other 200 to 300 pound gators underwater in the 1920s. Billy in particular would become a kind of star in his own right. Nearly all of the large alligator jaws seen on movie screens between the 1910s through the 1960s were actually his. Directors were fond of this reliable reptile because his jaws automatically opened when a chunk of meat dangled above his head, just above the camera's field of vision, which is also a good way to get... Never mind. I don't know where that was going. I was going to say the host of Communicore Weekly, but we'll do that for churros or... Usually it's, it works with Swedish fish for me. Swedish fish? Okay. Yeah. Dangle in front of me, I'll do... Boom. I'll, I'll People, do it. Yeah, well, I'll let the cadets know to bring some of those on the Communicore. Absolutely. So, anyway, back to Billy the Alligator. He was a big show-off, kind of like us. Um, <laughs> you know, he enjoyed doing all sorts of tricks, and he, especially sliding down the, the chutes that they had at the alligator farm. Um, but he was also pretty docile for an alligator, um, so much so that after five decades in the movie business, um, the handlers can actually put a saddle on him, and he gave young visitors a ride. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I would trust putting... <sighs> a kid on top of an alligator and letting him just roam around but um hey you know whatever whatever they think is safe back then that's that's fine wow okay well back to the alligator farm <clears throat> i just can't get that image out of my head <laughs> um, <clears throat> get me okay so there was a fence that surrounded the entire property that was designed to keep the alligators inside and the gator snatchers outside. Despite that protective measure, the alligator sanctuary was po a popular site for many college fraternity pranks. Uh, during local universities' hell week, pledges were often caught attempting to steal an alligator. Um, fortunately, only a few alligators bit the hand that stole them. Only a few. Only a few. So However, even without the extra help from uh, college kids, dumb college kids, some alligators <laughs> still managed to get away. Um, most of them that did get away, they escaped when floodwaters were really high from heavy rain or the nearby reservoir made it easy to slip out and for them to get away. So they were actually found quite frequently taking a dip in some of the, uh, the neighboring pools and swimming pools of some of the neighbors, which is kind of frightening if you wake up and you mm -hmm. see an alligator in your pool in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, and also because of all the alligators, there was, you know, a thousand plus of them. Some of the, the neighbors complained about the, the noise that their collective growls made, which I can see being annoying in the middle of the night. I'm, I don't know if I've ever heard an alligator I growl. I don't think I have either. I'm going to have to Google that later. Yeah, we'll have to add that special effect. So, or maybe not. You were expecting me to do it and I, I wasn't going to give it to it. <laughs> not at all. I couldn't okay. do it. I just couldn't do all it. Right, plus, I didn't let's... know what they sounded like. So that was the main reason why. <laughs> You just make any noise and put it in there. Rawr. Okay, well, all right. There you go. 
after great the post, Great post editing, thank you. Okay, well, by 1946, Francis Ernest Sr. passed away, and the farm was taken over by his son, Francis Victor Ernest Jr. Makes sense. Uh, by May 1953, Ken Ernest, who was Francis's grandson, moved the farm to a new two-acre site in Buena Park, right next door to Knott's Berry Farm. He also changed the name to the California Alligator Farm. Now, here, guests wandered inside the farm's four buildings that housed over 100 displays of snakes and lizards from throughout the entire world. Now, the buildings themselves were not a really pretty sight. Uh, it was really like a concrete jungle, and there was a really shallow swimming pool uh, for the alligators. And the entire thing was surrounded by a chain link fence and these really terrible looking trees and bushes that were kind of meant to invoke the feeling of the South, but it was still pretty, pretty bad looking on their part. <laughs> Well, one of the uh, big attractions was an 18-year-old, 250-pound Galapagos tortoise named Humpy, which is a great name for a tortoise. Okay, so children of the owners would saddle up Billy Alligator and Humpy and race them around a 75-foot circular path. Um, Humpy strayed off the track once or twice and had, uh, had to be pushed back while Billy slithered on course. However, the winner was Humphrey, Humpy every time despite the fact that it took him 20 minutes to make it around that track. Still still don't know if I would trust that alligator, especially, you know, <sighs> racing after a turtle. Just a little Shut weird. Yep. So, aside from all those fun and games, if you can call them that, a lot of serious research actually took place uh, at the California Alligator Farm. Um, they were the first to breed the mugger crocodiles, uh, C- Cuban crocodiles, Silenese pythons, and the first to breed Nile cro- crocodiles in the Western Hemisphere. So a lot of good stuff happened there. Um, and on top of that, it was the most complete reptile collection in the world, and was advertised as one of the world's largest reptile farms. Now, more than 130,000 visitors, visitors would actually pass through the farm's door uh, during the peak years. But, but toward the end, that number would drop down to about 50,000 a year. And around that time, the farm was sold to the private estate of Arthur Jones, the Florida, the Florida inventor of the Nautilus sports equipment. The farm lasted until 1984 when the lease on the property was not renewed. Uh, the animals were moved to a private preserve in Florida. Now, to, to go out in style, uh, go out in style, of course, the closing activities featured a five-day rodeo where they caught all the alligators, crocodiles, and the caiman. Um, which was probably kind of ridiculous. Just a total free-for-all. <laughs> I just picture people with lassos, throwing them over their head, and trying to capture them. Exactly. But uh, today, the former site of the California Alligator Farm in Buena Park is still empty, and the only monument is a single pictorial tile set into the uh, the Pershing Square bench at 5th and Hill Streets in downtown Los Angeles. So, you know, next time you're in downtown Los Angeles and you pass that bench, have a seat. Hopefully a crocodile won't buy you. Or an alligator. He's a nerd, he's a geek, geek. but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah! It's George's Book of the Week. This week's book is The CG Story by Christopher Finch, and it was released in the last part of 2013. Christopher Finch is a familiar name to most Disney fans. He authored the many, many, many different editions of The Art of Walt Disney, which is actually a superb book in its own right. Uh, He's also written about Judy Garland, Norman Rockwell, and Jim Henson. So Finch is actually a perfect person to cover the topic of computer graphics as an art form, especially with his background as a painter and his firm grasp of the entertainment field. Okay, so computer graphics might really seem commonplace today and and sadly the preferred medium of most moviegoers, but it's hard to remember a time when it wasn't. Uh, the book, through its 288 pages and 14 chapters, you know, Finch offers an in-depth history of computers and cinema. Uh, my only real issue with the book is that it begins with a fairly comprehensive look at computer animation and then, by necessity, goes so broad that Finch only hits the biggest and the most groundbreaking. And also, many of the groundbreaking titles we see at the end of the book are foreign films that receive little distribution in the U.S. and will be very unfamiliar. Okay, so we actually start in 1839 with a look at punch cards and the beginnings of modern computing and and how it formed and started the nascent CG industry in the 50s and the 60s. Pixar, of course, is the major player in the beginning, uh, not back in 1839, of course, um, although it's not introduced that way. We do run into Ivan Sutherland, Ed Catmull, and other companies, uh, not other companies like them, but like uh, Magi and Synthivision. 
Lucas, of course, comes into play, then Spielberg, then Blade Runner and Tron. And from there, it's, it's a pretty detailed and exhaustive look at the evolution and changes in the industry. We meet the other big players and films that advance the art, uh, almost painfully slow until Jurassic Park and Toy Story. From there, it's a massive litany of massive films and special effect laden blockbusters. Finch brings forth the point that the art of CG was advanced slow, solely through commercials, then animated films, then major sci-fi movies, until it's become just another way to make films. The final chapters look at the modern artistry and how CG has overtaken the animation industry. We see the Marvel blockbusters, Avatar, Harry Potter, and of course the latest Disney and DreamWorks films. The book is massive and filled with some amazing stills and artwork. For anyone with a vested interest in animation and computer graphics, this is really a solid must-have. Fans and students of film will be thanking Finch for years uh, and use his work as a solid starting point. It, it is rather expensive. It's come, coming in at over $75 on retail, but it's a worthy addition for animation and film fans. Uh, the majority of the coverage does focus on Pixar and Lucasfilm, but not to the detriment of other companies and artists. And Jeff, I know you got a review copy as well. I didn't know if you wanted to throw anything in there as well. Yeah, I mean, like you said, there were some parts of it that were kind of slow moving and didn't really get into things as much as I would like it have to but again like you just mentioned as a fan of film and a student of film uh since that's my background it was mm -hmm. really interesting to hear you know more of the evolution and background of it and how it, initially it was strictly for uh, you know commercial it was a commercial medium before it became part of this huge blockbuster industry and now it's commonplace in every single hollywood movie that people see today i mean there are real there's rarely any films that don't contain an element of cg in them these days so it's really come a really long way and it was it was interesting to see the history of it um it's 75 dollars is a lot of money for any kind of book <laughs> that, yes, that's for sure um, I did I did enjoy reading it. Uh, it did take me a little while to get through, but I did enjoy reading it. And, um, you know, like you said, I'm big fans of animation and CG and you know, film fans, I think they'll get a kick out of it. Okay. And this week's book was called The CG Story by Christopher Finch. What we liked, what we didn't like, yeah, he's in the booze. 60-second review. We haven't looked at a um, theatrical release in a long time, but The Wind Rises, which is a Touchstone, Touchstone Pictures presentation, was just released, and that is a film by Hayao Miyazaki. And I wanted to talk about it a little bit briefly because it's still in the theaters, and every Communicore cadet has to go see it. This is important. Um, Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli have produced such films as Ponyo, Spirited Away, Cast in the Sky, and the incomparable My Neighbor Totoro. All fantastic you know, films. Yes, that we all love, and you all need to buy them on DVD. But this is... Blu-ray, George. Blu-ray, Blu Blu right. come on. Sorry, I was, I what was is in this, the wrong 1992? Come on. It, it could be. Uh, we're doing this through AOL, AOL right? Yeah, hang on, dial up. Yeah, do it. Uh, okay. Half our audience won't get that joke. <laughs> Probably not. Okay, so um, this is actually Miyazaki's last full-length feature. He's announced he's retiring, so it's doubly important triply important that people go see it okay so um this film is set in the empire of japan right before world war ii and it's looking at the life of jiro horikoshi and it's based on miyazaki's manga series about jiro horikoshi's life uh and it's sort of this film sort of parallels miyazaki's life a little bit which is kind of neat to look at it that way but the film is gorgeous it is beautiful the uh Set pieces are absolutely fantastic, and you need to go see it, which I'll keep saying that. Um, what always amazes me about a Studio Ghibli film, I'm probably supposed to be saying Ghibli, I'm messing it all up, but that's okay, is that nature is so important, and it's such a big part of this film as well. I mean, there are parts where, it, one part where it pans along a small creek, and there's a beautiful white flower alongside the greenery, and it does need to be there. It's just that little extra step that Miyazaki puts into the film. Um, also, one thing that really amazed me about this film was how they developed the characters. Um, Jiro uh, finds a love named Naoko, and there are points, parts in the film where they're very intimate with each other, not in the you know uh, an adult type way, but just the way that they're emotionally 
connected to each other and you can see it in their face you can hear it and you know that these characters love each other it's, it's a little bit of a slow movie and uh, it is pg-13 mainly for tobacco use and violence with uh, some of the plane crashes and stuff like that but it's still an absolutely amazing film and i urge everyone to go see it at their local theater you may have to drive to an art house theater or visit a larger city to go see it but it is well worth it and this is the wind rises by Studio Ghibli. And just just for the record, I have not seen it yet, and George has been telling me that I need to yes. go see it. And I want to see it. I've seen the previews, I've seen clips of it, and it looks gorgeous, especially because this is his last film. Yes. Obviously, I need to go see it on the big screen, so especially after this little review. I'm going to go see it. Maybe <laughs> maybe I'll go right now. We're just okay. going to stop recording the show, and I'll go see All it right, right now. I'm just kidding. We're going to we're gonna finish first, and then I'm going to then I'm gonna go see it. Oh, gosh, I almost got up and left. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey! What's that? It's a five-legged goat. Now, at the park that everyone considers a half-day park, Disney Hollywood Studios. Notice how what? I said that quickly before you were able to say anything. Um, yeah, okay. Disney Hollywood Studios, you'll find some remnants of the old Backlock Tour, which I do miss quite dearly. Now, if you look over your head while you're in Pixar Place, you'll see some skywalk bridges connecting some of the sound stages. Now, these bridges were once used during the walking tour portion of the Backlot Tour, and it allowed guests to see productions being made at the time, like when they were actually filming stuff at Disney Hollywood Studios, when it was Disney MGM Studios at the time. <laughs> um, but now, they only serve as relics to further the nature of this half-day park, so you're better off just going to the Animal Kingdom. I, yeah, I, I've got nothing. I'm going to take your stunt silence as, as agreeing <laughs> with me, and we'll just move on from there. Well, I'm wondering if this is the first five legged goat where we've actually insulted an entire theme park. Um, I've probably done it before. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that's true. Well, this you've is insulted Animal Kingdom more than enough times. I think it's about time I start retaliating. Honestly. You start hitting another one? <laughs> yes. I mean, come on. Well, so, Communicore Weekly, the snarkiest online show. Well, we, that's our unofficial title, of course. That's, that's right, we're not supposed to tell Everybody that. knows that. Everybody knows that, so. <laughs> well, well, at least the people that have made it all the way to the end of the show. Uh, yes. There yes. we go. Yes. Well, anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Yes, be sure to leave us a comment and rate us on iTunes. Let us know that you know how snarky we are. <laughs> <laughs> Leave us a nine-star snarky review yes. again. A, a so. nine-snark review. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> okay, so um, email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com. And, of course, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly. And you can follow us both on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Imagine Nerding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And, of course, give us a call on the Communicore Weekly goat line at 424 785 Four six two eight. We've gotten some really interesting messages on there lately. Russ, I'm talking to you. <laughs> yes, we're both looking at you right now. <laughs> I hope you feel bad. Okay, and don't forget that Communicore Weekly, the musical, is still available on Amazon, CD Baby, and iTunes, and everywhere great audio is sold. It's probably one of the most amazing things you will ever hear in your life. And it is so much better than Frozen. Yes, it absolutely is. And it, at, at this time, our karaoke, karaoke contest is going on. So be sure to go to CommunicoreWeekly.com and click on the contest tab and figure out uh, if you can karaoke some of the musical songs for a chance to win uh, a, a copy of Frozen and a $25 gift card to iTunes. So that'll be fun. Well, for Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and girls. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Communicore Weekly.